So they said that we would do this in the order of who's most right. So, <laughs> the, the, uh, no, actually, because I'm all about high duration, then they have to get me started earlier and gives us a little bit more extra time. And uh, I was just telling my colleagues here that um, this is my first experience this year teaching undergraduate students. My previous jobs, I didn't get to do that. I only worked with professional students or no students. And so I've learned, that perhaps just, I don't know, it's just me, that I don't use PowerPoint. I just stand up and talk to them for three hours, and then when the clock ticks, we're done. And so I have one slide, unfortunately, for you guys. And, but you guys probably don't want the one. And I'm saying you guys because I'm in Washington, D.C. In, in Texas, we don't say that word. We say y'all. So anyhow, this is, this is uh, my argument. The, the, the format of this is we're, we thought it would be neat to have one point that we're going to make and stick to it. You know, instead of having three points or sub points or something like this, and I'm going to try to do that. Um, and so my case is for very high duration of frequency. And um, when I say very high, I mean um, if, if the current recommendation is 75 minutes of vigorous or 150 minutes per week of moderate, I would say let's multiply that by, you know, I don't know, an order of magnitude or something, way high, okay? And so when we talk about high duration, I'm talking very high. The, the argument for that is that for the person who sleeps eight hours a day, that means you're awake 16, and then there's seven days in the week and you can do the math. That's, we're talking over 900 minutes a day of opportunity to do something for your health. If you can do something that's safe and has a dose response that doesn't plateau off, then that's, that's what you want. That's the best thing you could do. Um, so I believe that the, the evidence is, is heading us toward that type of dose response understanding. We are not today literally at the point of being able to provide incredibly practical advice like maybe some of you have been giving to your patients. But I think that we're not far away. I'm quite hopeful about that. And I believe that the reason we want high duration is because the body is sensing what you're doing every minute and every hour of the day. It responds to that. And if you treat it well, then it will get better. Okay, so we want to give a dose that's safe and effective. Uh, and, and so that's the key. That's what we want to do. Now, now I'm going to throw in a couple of the caveats, okay? Uh, one of them is I'm not saying that all types of muscle contractions are equally effective, okay? Because they're not. I'm not saying everything counts. I, I think that some things will be a waste of time. Some things will be very effective, surprisingly effective, okay? I'm not saying that everything is equally safe, because it's not. Some things are gonna be dangerous and you shouldn't be spending very much time at all doing it. And some things you wanna do a lot of. And, and if you saw the, the talk that we had this afternoon, we did a demonstration. We chose to have a participant moseying around because that is historically what human beings did a lot of. I'm not suggesting that that is going to be the panacea for a public health problem. Okay? I'm not advocating that people go out and get standing desk or treadmill desk. I'm not saying to do that. All right? Um, but I am saying that if we understand a little bit more about the dose response, then we could really surprise ourselves and we could develop very effective tools that will help all kinds of people, whether you are. You're, you're somebody who does HIT currently, whether you're somebody who does moderate activity currently, and whether you're somebody who's incredibly sedentary and can't even uh, do any of those type of activity. I think we're getting that point. Um, there's, there's a fair bit of work being done in this area right now. Seven, eight years ago, there were just a handful of papers coming out every year. The last couple years, if you, if you Google, or not Google, PubMed keywords for uh, sedentary behavior, or sedentary time, or sitting, those type of words. There's over a thousand papers a year. There's a lot going on. Um, and so that has good things, right? There's a lot of people who are interested in it. 
It also means that, that it can be a little confusing, especially to people who are saying, I'm a practitioner, give me the bottom line, I want to see it now. And I can't keep up with the literature by myself, okay? It, that's how big it is. So one of the things that we're going to try to do is we have a new organization that I re referred to earlier today, and we have an email address, and people can subscribe to it if they want. And we're going to try to provide a, a, a way of organizing what's happening in this whole area. It's going to be much more focused than, say, an ACSM website or something like this. And it's going to be more than a website and a, and a mailer. Uh, it's going to be, hopefully, a way to engage the practitioners. I think that, that if we really want to have a revolutionary change in things, we're now at the stage where, just because the world is different in terms of the way we communicate, that sometimes big solutions, especially if it involves lifestyle, big solutions can take place very rapidly. And, and, and that means that all of you can, can participate in this, uh, as opposed to maybe the old school model where we would write grant proposals, wait a year, and hopefully get a good review, get started, and two or three years later do it. Then when you publish your work, if it catches on with the right people who happen to be on a blue ribbon panel, they'll mention it in some kind of guidelines, and it'll eventually change something. And, and we could have a whole discussion about how slow moving that is in all disciplines and fields. And I'm saying, why do we have to do that? We have people who don't study physical activity, who, who are doing all kinds of stuff. And, and big changes happen a lot of times. And I, so that's why I'm hopeful. Because I, I, what I'm seeing, again, I can't describe it all. A lot of this is unpublished from other people's work and so on. But we are on the verge of seeing some major revolutionary changes, I think. I think you will be shocked when the data comes out. And then that's going to lead to a need to clarify, to explain it, and make sure that people can be action-oriented. All righty, thank you. Can I just jump right in? Hi, Mark Fenton. Um, how many of you watched The Big Bang Theory? You guys know that show? Do you know that there are like all these guys with PhDs? And then there's the guy who's named Howard Wolowitz, who just has a master's from MIT in engineering. That's this guy right here. So I'm the dummy on the panel, the token engineer with the master's degree. I'm not kidding. That's really who I am. I swear I'm Howard Wallowitz. Nice to meet you all. Um, so, so I even have, worse than that, I'm going to discredit myself even further by um, telling you my deep, dark secret, which will make you, if, if you were going to take me seriously before, you'll now lose all possibility. I was a competitive athlete, and I actually lived out at the US Olympic Training Center while training in the most uh, unusual looking event in all of track and field. Who can tell me what that is? It would, of course, be race walking. There it is, photographic evidence that I was a race walker back in the day. And the evidence, as you can tell, is very, very old because we only had black and white photography back then. And those shorts were in style back when I was competing, I swear. This is the, nah, let me think, this is the 1928 national championships. And many people will ask Mark why race walking of all the events you might have done. And the answer is obvious when I show you the next picture. It was, of course, the huge crowds that showed up at our competitions. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating, that is the start of the 1984 Olympic Trials 50 kilometer race walks. That's a 31 mile event, five miles longer than the marathon, longest foot race in the Olympics, and that's the LA Coliseum. You may remember 84 games were in Los Angeles, that's the Coliseum where they also hosted the Olympic Trials in June that year. Um, like the marathon, you start on the stadium track, you go through the tunnel, do a loop in the city, in our case a, a confined two and a half kilometer loop because there are judges watching to make sure you're not breaking from race walking into running. Then you come back in the stadium to finish, so this was 6 a.m. And if you look very, very closely, you can see, right here, my mom and dad. <laughs> Six in the morning. I promise that when we came in the stadium four hours later, the stadium was packed, other events were going on, it was cool. But my mom and dad. Okay, so I'm telling you that so you know that I lived at the U.S. Olympic Training Center, spent a lot of time catching a athletes falling off the back of the treadmill as they completed VO2 max tests and pricking fingers to get lactate threshold. So I'm, I consider myself somewhat a student of exercise science. I studied biomechanics in detail. I, believe, I, I then worked at Reebok's Human Performance Lab and watched the each fad come through, step, first aerobics, then step, then spinning, then, you know, it's sort of one idea after another. And in fact, my great lesson from all of my time sort of working in the, in the health and fitness industry, if I may, and I'm really distressed to say this, is that as a nation, we're not very physically active at all. 
If you look at the self-report data, CDC might tell you the numbers are as high as 50% based on um, the, uh, the National Health Interview, or maybe the BRFSS gets numbers like 20 or 30%. But if you look at objective measurement, like accelerometer data, you get numbers like maybe 40% of kids, 20%, or 10% of adolescents, and maybe 5% of adults meeting the, the guidelines. So I, like Mark, agree that we got to think about another way to get people to think about physical activity and telling them to go to exercise, capital E, is probably not a path that's very fruitful. And as a guy who's been at more fitness walking events than you can possibly measure, giving out t-shirts and water bottles, um, I, I'm not diminishing the importance of health fairs and education and encouragement. I'm saying it's not enough. And since we said, let's put out a, a sort of a contentious notion, my contentious notion is going to be uh, that if you were going to do one thing, and only one thing, in your quest to help people be more physically active, you would actually think about making a more walkable world. Before you even focused on trying to tell individuals to walk more. Indeed, the Surgeon General's call to action on pro to promote walking and walkable communities, which came out in fall of 2015, has over 350 citations at the end of it. The studies that essentially build the evidence base that says we can't just tell people to walk. We actually have to build more walkable communities. Right, if we're going to really be successful. And if you look closely at the kind of evidence that out there, cited here and in a great body of literature that's really evolved only in the last 10 or 15 years, you'll see that essentially we have to think on three scales. The scale of land use, like where we put stuff. Are we going to keep putting schools on the edge of town far away from where kids live, or are we going to go back to neighborhood elementary schools so meaningful numbers of children could actually walk to and from school on a regular basis? How many people here walked to school at some point during their career as a kid? Look around the room. Indeed, in 1970s, nearly 50%, 40% of kids walked and biked to school. By 2000, that number dropped to 15%. Meanwhile, in 1970, maybe 10 to 15% of kids were driven to school, and by 2000, that had grown to 50%. It's a pretty dramatic change in three decades, and it's the three decades in which childhood obesity rates tripled. That's not coincidence. As we eliminate routine physical activity from daily life, we're a species, I believe fully what you said in your talk earlier, we evolved to move and move a lot during, throughout the day. And we've eliminated that by how we've designed our communities. But we also know the network matters, sidewalks, bike lanes, pathways, trails, the facilities that connect those destinations, and indeed the details of design matter. There's a growing body of research that tells us whether there are street trees and awnings and benches and whether the building is up at the street or behind a giant parking lot like most of what we've built for the last 30 or 40 years. Those things matter. Um, so my sort of notion, if I'm going to boil it down to one fun fundamental point, I will paraphrase the leading brains in the field on the first four bullets. That's the stuff you already know. We face a physical inactivity epidemic. I'm, by the way, not calling it an obesity epidemic anymore. Anytime I have an opportunity to address a group, I say it's an inactivity epidemic. Being sedentary is very unhealthy. We know that. We know some activity is better than none, and we know more is better than some. I'm paraphrasing I'm in Lee and indeed you when I say that. And we know occasional intensity is better still. I know that as a competitive athlete who did everything from you know, intervals to Vartlet training to all sorts of stuff. We, all of that's true. But my takeaway point, if we're going to make one single point, is we must build environments that support routine physical activity if we're going to be remotely successful at the population level. If we just keep talking to the same people who come to the gym, come to our classes, who we can line up as clients, we're talking to the same population that's already physically active. We're dealing with the worried well. I want to deal with those who are not active at all, and I believe the landscape matters. So I'll challenge you to think about how you could be an agent of change in your community to actually advocate for that neighborhood sidewalk, the trail, the crosswalk, like those kids in Weslaco, Texas, painted as a part of a community wellness initiative to make it safe for them to walk from their high school to the state college that's across the street where a lot of students take uh, advanced classes and uh, vocational classes, but they couldn't cross the street. So they literally would drive over there. Maybe improving that crosswalk, they'll add a little more routine physical activity to their day. That's, I think, what we have to think about. So that's my challenge, and I, and I hope you'll join me in that. Thank you, guys. Okay, I'm up uh, third. Um, unlike the first two speakers, I promised to stick to my five minutes, so I'm <laughs> timing myself here. Uh, we were asked to stick to five slides and start with uh, our first most important point, uh, which would be this. Uh, and I wouldn't discount anything that was said before. I think we need to move more. We need to build more livable cities, of course. Uh, but the number one cited barrier for why people aren't active more is, is time. Clearly, it's an excuse for a lot of people. But a lot of us lead very busy time press lives. 
And so I think uh, the case is quite strong that uh, intensity trumps duration when it comes to longevity, uh, as well as uh, being a potent stimulus to, to boost cardiorespiratory fitness, which we know is a really important health-related marker. Uh, I wanted to start with some data. So these are uh, from the Copenhagen City Heart Study, uh, studies that you can only do in Denmark because everyone uh, cycles. Uh, what they did in the study was really interesting. They followed about 20,000 people. Uh, this is data from a subset of 5,000 individuals where they said, as you're cycling around Copenhagen, would you just self-rate yourself as a relatively fast cyclist? Uh, do you sort of keep up with everyone else, mod modest pace, or are you uh, slow? And also, how much do you cycle on average? Less than 30 minutes a day, up to an hour or more than an hour. And the key point here, look at the data on left, that's data for men and the effective intensity. So on average, the fast cyclists live five years longer uh, compared to uh, the, the slow cyclists. There was no influence of duration. Uh, the data for women were very similar. And so the very simple conclusion was that relative intensity and not duration of cyclists was more important for all cause and cardiovascular disease mortality. Uh, these are data from 50,000 individuals who were followed in Norway, part of the Hunt study, uh, where they were looking at the association between intensity, duration of exercise, and, and mortality. And what they found was that just a single weekly bout of high-intensity exercise reduced the risk of cardiovascular death. And in this case, there was no effect of increasing duration or number of exercise sessions. So I often get the question, you know, if, if I just did one bout of high-intensity exercise a week, is that more risky? And the answer is clearly uh, no. You know, I'm going to get into this more in my talk tomorrow. But if you look at uh, the large-scale studies, it would suggest just even a single weekly bout of exercise of high intensity is beneficial. Uh, why is it beneficial? Clearly, part of the reason is the effect on uh, cardiorespiratory fitness, as we objectively measure using a VO2 max test. Uh, we know, uh, and, and certainly many in this room would be familiar with these data showing this very strong relationship between mortality, risk of dying from all causes, and cardiorespiratory fitness. Just getting out of the lowest quartile uh, is, is obviously very important. But if you try to look at the numbers, those individuals who have a one met higher cardiorespiratory fitness, that's about 10% for an average person, 13% lower risk of dying. And in terms of the risk reduction, it's similar to what you would see with two inches off your waist, a five-point drop in blood pressure, or about a one millimolar drop in blood sugar in terms of relative risk. So you think about the medications it would take to elicit these effects, uh, you can see a similar change if you have a one met higher uh, cardiorespiratory fitness. And so that's led many to call for cardiorespiratory fitness to be the fifth vital sign, right? Along with things like blood pressure, blood sugar, what we measure in the doctor's office uh, routinely. This was a call last year in circulation that made the point and argued that small increases in cardiospiratory fitness. So again, one or two METs, these are 10, 15% changes in an average person, huge effects in terms of reducing uh, morbidity uh, and the effect on lowering cardiovascular event rates. So, uh, you know, the common recommendation, of course, that we see in public health guidelines is 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise based on lots of evidence, of course. Uh, these are data, though, that were published last year, and quite a surprising finding and a troubling finding, and that was individuals who did guideline evidence. So 150 minutes per week of moderate exercise failed to increase cardiorespiratory fitness in almost half the individuals. So lots of good things, of course, associated with doing exercise like this, but in terms of boosting your cardiorespiratory fitness, 40% of adults in this study, it didn't improve it. And so I would make the case that intervals or high intensity exercise uh, will be better off. And this is from another recent meta-analysis showing that if you do longer intervals of a higher intensity, that can basically eliminate this non-response of cardiorespiratory fitness in almost all adults. Uh, high intensity interval training is not just for highly trained individuals or people of average fitness. There's Dozens and dozens of systematic reviews and meta-analyses now that have compared more intense exercise versus the traditional approach, finding in this case individuals with lifestyle-induced cardiometabolic disease that it's superior to the traditional approach. And my last point is you don't have to do much of it. This is some work that we've been involved with that was looking at individuals who just did one four-minute bout of high-intensity exercise and then compared that to a group that was doing four four-minute bouts, just that single four-minute bout of high-intensity exercise. You do that three times a week. You boost your cardiorespiratory fitness. You lower your blood pressure and your fasting glucose. Uh, thanks. I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Wow, you've been close. No
Oh, you did it, man. You did it. I'm giving it to you. I'm giving it to you. So we're opening up to questions now. Um, I can come around with the mic, or folks can come up here if you have a question. supposed to talk in this yeah. so um, yeah I, I just, I'm not sure to be honest to be fair I understand your your question it, you so you're saying sort of uh, intentional walking versus maybe some other kind of incidental walking is, is that what you're getting at um, you didn't really specify the type of activity that you're that's right that's right so Okay, so, so um, I, I think I understand what you're saying. Sort of the mode of activity, what you're, what you're doing. So I think that, that um, the mode is probably going to be the, 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 the most challenging thing to, to develop uh, of all the parameters that we describe exercise, you know, intensity, duration, frequency, and mode. Um, I think that when the when when the public agrees upon the mode question, I think that 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 will be uh, will be there. We'll be will be at the point where we want to see big big time changes. Um, at this point, I don't think that that there is agreement. There's certainly not in the literature that I know of. Um, and so, one of my introductory points I was trying to make is that all types of contractual activity are not equivalent. I think that that's safe to say, um, and that's that's a way of saying it without being disparaging towards what some people might argue some modes are better than others. Um, and so, one of the, the the keys to the right mode, if you ask me, is going back to the to the the dose response parameters of duration, and frequency, uh, and and safety. And safety probably should be even said first. But that, and so when when something fits that criteria then you've got the right mode. Does that help? It's probably not, it's not telling you a prescription, uh, but I think that that's, that's the kind of criteria that I personally use when I try to think of, when I evaluate studies and look at where somebody's really heading. Um, and that's, that's one of the reasons why I might say something like a standing desk isn't just the right solution. There's been evidence out there for a long time that people who have to stand a lot at work in one place actually sometimes have more cardiovascular disease, not less. And, and those who have uh, run out and bought those desks and done that, they, they usually if you watch folks who do that, and a number of corporations have invited me to see what they're doing, and, and uh, usually somebody spent a lot of money on those desks, and, uh, and they're they're not wanting it to be evaluated poorly. And, but even so, when you walk through the building, you see you know, some people using some not, and those who are kind of slouching over it. And then you say, well, how do you feel at the end of the day? Well, I, you know, a little bit tired, and you go home. And so what are you doing the rest of the day after that? You still, you might spend half your day at work, but you got the other half to do. So if you're not going out on a walk with your wife and kids and doing other things because you've been staying at your desk, well, that's backfiring. And so, so I would say that, that that, in my opinion, is probably not going to be the public health solution we're looking for. It's great to do if, if your back feels better. It's great to do if, if you, you, know, you, you like it. Um, but I haven't seen a whole lot of science saying it's a great thing to do for a public health solution. Uh, and so walking is, is a little trickier because uh, we don't have an environment that's conducive to walking a lot. Uh, and you know we live in a different world. I, I would love to be able to walk to work, but that would be, um, you know, a, 
a very challenging thing to do where I live in Houston. Um, and so, um, but if, if we could have public policy and a lot of taxes and get walking going, then that would be great. You know, I don't, I don't know. I just, do you know something happening that makes you more optimistic? I don't. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I do actually. Okay. Good. Yeah. Uh, Four dollar gallon gas helped us a lot. We saw dramatic increases in public transit use, bicycling to work. We did actually measurable decreases in single occupancy vehicle work. And the recession did a good job on that, too. Um, and we know that the oil supply isn't infinite. You know, $4 gallon gas is around the corner again. And even the Houstons of the world are actually beginning to reinvent themselves, as you probably well know. You've got light rail now. You can actually, there is a section of the city that's got train in it. And it didn't. Houston was a classic car-only city. In fact, it has my favorite picture of the widest road in America. I literally found a section of road between the highways and the frontage roads that was about 22 total lanes. You know I'm not making that up. It's that perimeter. You've driven on it. You've probably been caught in traffic on it because it's very inefficient. It doesn't work particularly well either. So cities even like Houston and historically automobile-oriented cities are really rethinking themselves because what we're finding is there's desirability among millennials and empty desk baby booners to live in more walk and bike and transit-friendly cities. Uh, we're seeing cities across the country launch bike share programs. Um, so there's some evidence. And indeed, I would use your example, if I may, Martin. You, you know, he, you pointed out that Denmark was a perfect place to do that research, and it's because everybody cycles there. That's because 30 years they made con 30 years ago they made conscious policy decisions. In other words, that's not because Danes are intrinsically, you know, more Nordic and tougher than us. It's because, in fact, 30 years ago they were really, really concerned that they were killing a lot of pedestrians and bicyclists. They had real traffic problems there. They launched a bunch of initiatives. They actually launched the modern safe routes to school movement that we now in the US have adopted, if anybody of you, of you have worked on that walk and bike to school. Um, and they've been effective because now 30 years down the road, places like Copenhagen are really bike, you know, you see 70 year old ladies riding bikes down the street with groceries. Um, so it's not accidental. And, and in fact, you know, I would argue that we're, we're all really saying the same thing, you know, that, that indeed, uh, because I fully agree that the, those, the more intense cyclist is going to clearly benefit more. I personally tend to benefit from that myself. So I, I know that that's very true um, anecdotally, and I'm not surprised that the evidence is taking us there. But I got to build that environment for them. If I'm going to get large numbers of people biking and riding these bike share systems, then we need what are called protected bike lanes. But cities are doing it, to your point. The question is, are cities doing it? They are. They're actually starting to create new networks of bicycle facilities. So I hold out at least a little hope for what it's worth. You want to comment on that uh, mode question? No, no, I, I'm curious if the audience has more questions. I, I guess I, I, you know, we're we were purposely uh, pitched adversarially, if you will. But I, I think all of us would suggest that all of these approaches are good. They're, uh, you know, going to be appropriate for different people, of course. So, um, but please, questions. This is supposed to be interactive. Yeah, so the question basically relates to the behavioral side of things, uh, and, and you're right, and I'll, you know, I'll address some of this in my uh, presentation tomorrow. I think there's two schools of thought, and I would characterize, and I'm not an, a behavioral psychologist, um, but I think it's fair to say the traditional rule of thumb is if exercise is more intense, if it's above lactate threshold, it's perceived as aversive, it hurts, people are unlikely to do it. But there's a whole uh, other side to that. And if you talk to the exercise and health psychologists, many of them will say, well, wait a minute. Continuous vigorous exercise is completely different from intermittent vigorous exercise. And there's just immense emerging evidence now to suggest that at least some people prefer that type of exercise. They rate it uh, as they enjoy it more. And so I think it comes down to different strokes for different folks, right? And, and so especially in the psychology area, I find this is pitched as extremely adversarial to the point that you know, you're just trying to shout down the other person. My point with interval training is it's, it's another tool in the tool, toolbox. It's another menu option to choose from. 
it's not for everyone and it's not for the same person all of the time, but to totally discount it and say, this will never work for public health because it hurts, I don't think that's doing uh, justice to the, to the science um, either. Um, and, and there's a lot of uh, emerging evidence around this topic, but it's a really important one, the behavioral side of things. CSM recommendations came out in 96 um, to promote health. The, the recommendation was to do individual exercise prescription, taking into account frequency, intensity, and uh, duration, and, and mode. And, and that specifically, I think, the, the up until 96 was intended to promote cardiovascular health to increase aerobic capacity and other components of fitness. And then I think in 96, when the public health recommendations came out, I, I, it wasn't intended to replace the, the individual exercise prescription. It was just to say, oh, by the way, you can get other health benefits. Uh, you can have lower risk of heart disease, diabetes, cancers, et cetera, by doing, doing other types of physical activity as well. So I, I, I guess, you know, in terms of specificity, you know, the issue of fitness versus health, uh, I think is, is an important one. And because I, I agree, I think all of you are sort of right, uh, depending on what component of we're looking at components of fitness or, or just you know individual public health um, becomes an issue. But if you want to increase aerobic capacity, then obviously the, the more vigorous intensity I think is, is uh, a way to go. Thank you very much for your, your presentation. It was great. Uh, so my question is more on the, the clinical side uh, with the validated patients or clients are those that may have lower extremity or people with PAD, PE, or kidney disease, dialysis, they're exercising in that, right? So with the new guidelines, will there be a sweet spot, like a proportionate titration? So you have somebody, and you're saying, well, we want them to be this duration, this duration. So we know that we're never going to get people to be able to tolerate that volume of activity. And that, that's that's the whole reason behind Dr. Paul, why you're, uh, why people in your line of work have uh, used the HIT because it's attractive for that purpose. So what, if there is, will there be some kind of a sweet spot of proportion? So you're saying go much longer. So what will that number be? What should we be shooting for with someone who can't utilize or tolerate uh, weight bearing activity or any kind of activity for long periods or they have to work intermittently because of something like PAD, PD, or doing a dialysis or something like that? So is there anything coming up the pipe for that? So, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. No, no, the, the, uh, um, you know, we, we, we want to be direct in our answers. It, it, it's sometimes challenging. And so, um, so you're talking about a, a clinical population that has a lot to gain. In other words, yeah, so that's right. They're that's, not going to be able to tolerate that's right. the durations and the volumes that we're telling maybe some of the cardio, cardio metabolic high risk can't yeah. do with. Yeah. If we if we move along and if we get them in line, we can't. Right. So so so, because let's just start with 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 a, see if we agree on this. Is is that, if if the individual is is very sick and is looking for a cure, and I'm okay with saying cure. Um, I think that some diseases can be cured, um, and and certainly if they have a disease and they don't want it to progress into another disease, because oftentimes one chronic disease leads to another. Uh, whether we're talking about things ranging from dementia to some cancers and so on. I think that those are the individuals that oftentimes have the, the, the most willpower. Somebody who's willing to take radiation, chemotherapy, or surgery should have a lot of willpower to do physical activity. And it may be considered a nuisance or, or maybe they're culturally, it's a little different. You know, they don't have a family that supports them on this kick. But if they have a lot to gain, then I, sh I would argue that, uh, that they are the people who would, who would put the most into it. It has to be safe. Uh, and, and so I'm not a clinician, but my, my sense is that if we looked at safety and pain and injury and we graphed on the x-axis intensity, sort of a whole body vigorous approach, the risk of injury and other complications would increase exponentially as we raise the intensity. 
if you keep the duration very low, way down in that level to where it takes very little exertion, then those people, yes, it takes willpower and a cultural change, but they could perhaps be active every hour of the day. Again, that's a cultural change. Um, but again, if, if, if I were asked to take a medication for the rest of my life, I would probably say I might do that. If, if I had to take a medication that my life depended upon it in the short term, you're darn right I would do it. And, and so, so I, would, I would say that's, that's why I'm enthusiastic about that level. Now, what we can see, I can't give you epidemiological statistics for what we're talking about, where you take a disease population and give them a high duration of very low intensity. But we can see remarkable physiological gains um, in, in well-controlled physiology studies. Uh, you know, I'll speak more to the safety data tomorrow. I, I, I would disagree with the sort of characterization that increasing, exponent, increasing exercise intensity exponentially increases risk. I, I don't think that's supported by the data. And I'll say the same thing. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a clinician, but I'll, I'll show some evidence tomorrow. I think at the individual level, obviously, proper screening is, is important and, and, and critical. Um, you know, if someone has a musculoskeletal injury or peripheral nerve pain or something, uh, to suggest high volume for them, I, I don't think that's going to be the answer uh, either. And sometimes it's how you apply the intensity. You know, if you do intense swimming exercise, that's obviously very different from, from running uphill. Um, but in, in terms specifically of, of cardiovascular risk, I, I would disagree with the assertion that uh, increasing intensity exponentially uh, increases risk. So the question was about policy and governmental involvement in, in making these things more feasible. Yeah, I mean, it's so, so um, certainly when we talk about structural changes in a city, you're going to have to have policy. It's going to cost money. And so developers, you know, have to put in sidewalks, for example, and when they build a new neighborhood. Um, in Houston, uh, I've actually lived in Houston twice. The first time I was there as a postdoctoral fellow in my first job after that, uh, they were just building all these concrete trails along the bios. And so these are concrete ditches generally, and they could build more concrete to make it easier to cycle. So I love that because uh, when we moved there, uh, I asked my wife, please go and I don't care what you find for us to rent as long as, as I can ride my bike to work. I don't want to get in the traffic. I don't care about the heat. I don't care about the bugs. I, I want to commute that way. And so, but see, that wouldn't have happened unless somebody spent a lot of money to put in those trails. Now, unfortunately, they got a big governmental grant, and most of the money was spent on the engineers planning it. And by the time they started building it, we just saw, you know, yellow stripes on a few roads. And so it really didn't make it like Copenhagen. Uh, Copenhagen is great because you have these bike lanes where uh, you, they're, you know, pieces of concrete that protect you, and everybody does it. So culturally, it's normal. And I think the cultural changes are really have to come for, before any of these things happen. You know, when there's a cultural movement, politicians pay attention and listen, right? Um, and you don't feel ostracized for being unusual. So uh, I worked in Copenhagen for just a few weeks one year, and it was, it was wonderful because you'd get on the bike to ride wherever you were going, and you know nobody changed their clothes to do it like we do in the United States. It, the, the women would wear dresses, and they, nobody wore helmets, by the way, either. But that they would put the little kids on the bike, which is terribly dangerous in our current you know, thinking. But they would do it, and it would start raining, and nobody got off their bikes, and they just kept going. And you didn't feel awkward walking into work all wet. And whereas here in the United States, you're supposed to shower after a short walk to work and all these other things, and so you, it feels awkward. And so many of these things we're talking about are cultural. 
you don't want to be the one person in the family or the workplace or whatever doing something because why are you doing that you know and um, and if you have a life-threatening disease people should cut you some slack but also if you don't want to have dementia and you want to be able to retire with some level of health and optimize it you, you but but we deal with that in the United States and I don't know what it's like globally but that's very frustrating to uh, it's interesting, your point about helmets is, is interesting because if you look at rates of helmet wearing, they're higher in the U.S. than in the Netherlands and Germany. And if you look at rates of fa injuries and fatalities in bicyclists per kilometer traveled, they're much lower in those nations where helmet wearing is lower. And it's because they've built the infrastructure in other, and the cultural norms. Anybody who's even driving a car probably rides a bike enough that they're sensitive to cyclists, they're attuned to cyclists being on the road as part of the, the network. So your, your point is interesting about the helmets and it's and anecdote, your anecdote is, is supported by the evidence. Um, I'd only say that the, the discussion, this cultural shift seems to be getting driven now in the U.S. There are cities in the U.S. I mean, go to Davis, California, or Santa Barbara, you know, places where the universities are really bike-oriented and so on. They literally have bicycle roundabouts because they have so much bike traffic on those campuses during changing time between classes and getting on and off to housing, student housing and so on. So we are now, we, we used to, guys like me had to show pictures of Copenhagen and Amsterdam and Barcelona and stuff to show walkable and bikeable. We don't anymore. I can show you Portland and I can show you Boulder and by the way, you know, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Madison, Wisconsin, you know, elements of those kinds of communities, including cold weather communities. One of the interesting things that seems to be happening is now that the economics are proving to be desirable communities. People want to live in these kinds of communities. I showed earlier in my talk evidence from organizations like the National Association of Realtors and National Association of Home Builders saying that walkability sells. Right, that people are looking, and particularly again amongst two population groups, empty nest baby boomers and uh, guys that are moving to go work for the university or a research facility in Houston, for example, who are saying, I want to be near the bike trail, right? That's, you're not an outlier, you're the, the new normal. Um, uh, and even when Amazon went through its whole HQ2 thing, when it was looking at the cities, if you look at the cities that they ended up sort of winnowing down toward, they're very well transit served and they are cities that are doing things like launching bike share and are gonna be very desirable for the millennials that they're trying to recruit to work there to live in. So it may be, we're hopeful, that the economic benefits that these cities are seeing will help uh, drive some of the cultural shift that, that I think you're rightly saying is gonna have to occur, for what it's worth. Oops. Just very briefly, and Canada is no better than the U.S. in this regard, but if you talk to Bob Salas, who's a clinician, obviously, who spearheaded the Exercise in Medicine initiative, it drives Bob crazy that he cannot refer a client to an exercise specialist like yourself, but he can refer someone to bariatric surgery, and it's, it's paid for. I, I was in Brisbane last, last week, uh, and there they have, it was a very similar conference, but a big difference in Australia is exercise professionals can be referred to and it's covered on, on, on public health care dollars. And you know, you do the math on that and it seems to folks like us to be a no-brainer mm -hmm. uh, before we even talk about infrastructure and that. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know why that's the case. And like I say, Canada's no better than the U.S. Well, we had an interesting point made in an earlier session. One of you made it, I think, that sort of as we get this next generation of pedestrians and bicyclists out there, they become the advocates, by the way, who could help push this change at the elected level. So, you know, I'm right with you on that. If we could be prescribing, you know, to go get some guidance and get some coaching and get yourself into an active lifestyle, that person now becomes one of our advocates as we try to make this deeper cultural change. No. Yeah. 
I don't. I don't think so. Um, I, I. I. I don't think so at all. Um, I think that that we could take the most fit person in this world, or at least in this room, and I could immediately improve many, many metabolic parameters, cardiovascular parameters in them within hours. Um, and I can make it very bad in hours too. Uh, the, uh, um, you know, you, you all know about the effects of bed rest. That's been studied since the 60s. And, and bed rest is not lack of exercise as we recommend it. Bed rest is lack of just incidental movement. Um, and there's postural changes as well. But we, you could study chair rest and you can see the same thing. And so, um, so, so I think it's, it can be very bad um, for very fit people as well, which means that fit people have a lot to gain by paying attention to that. Sure. So he said no, was yeah. his answer. My answer is a little more like I'm not sure I care initially. I don't care. And I, and I mean that in the sense that what I really want to do is get the person moving first, right, and create an environment where we get population level shift around that. Uh, my gut, and this is only anecdote, not evidence-based, and I'm, we're trying to do, we're actually trying to do a study right now of Springfield, Massachusetts, where they have recently passed a complete streets legislation, and we're going to try to do some measurements of physical activity levels and incidental, you know, sort of transportation, shifts in transportation norms. In other words, do we see less car traffic? Do we see more walking and bicycling? It's kind of a, we're trying to build on the natural experiment there. And the interesting thing, I would love to build a base so that we can stay with this city for a while. Because what I'd love to know is, does a cycling culture start to evolve there? Do they, do we find them having cycle races? And do they join, get cycling clubs? Because it would be a natural progression that I would yeah. expect based on anecdotal observation. You certainly have any number of cities in Colorado. You could look at a Fort Collins, not just Boulder, by the way, anymore. You could look at a Longmont or a Fort Collins, right? Or other places that have sort of built the infrastructure, a culture starts to get created, and then there's that group that moves the next level, right? Riding more seriously, more intensely, racing, you know. Um, so I expect that as a result of sort of operating at this cultural level to occur. And I suspect, as you said, some of that will be naturally self-selected and maybe appropriately so. People will choose to go in that direction because it's the right thing for them, okay. for what it's worth. Of course, you know, I, I'm one of these people, you know, again, maybe like a lot of you or maybe not, but I mean, as an academic, you sit a lot, you stare at a bloody computer a lot, and I don't like the evidence. <laughs> you know, I don't want to believe it. I want to think I can go out and pound at lunch uh, or after work, but I think the evidence is pretty clear. So, I mean, it's it's obviously hard to argue. I, I, I think all of, you know, I, I guess I would discount against Mark. Um, just to say an absolute no, I, I think boosting the intensity once in a while is good. We all got to climb the stairs sometimes, right? Or, or sprint for the, you know, the elevator or stuff like that. So, but I mean, all, all things being equal, moving from that lowest level of complete sedentary behavior, boosting fitness a little bit has huge benefits. So it's hard to argue with what you're saying, but I mean, it's also hard to argue with the fact that most people aren't doing stuff because they say they don't have any time to do it. So. Uh, so I think it's mostly for Dr. Hamilton. Um, it's probably kind of simple, but I've been trying to wrap my head around what you're exactly trying to promote. So what I'm doing in my head is like, uh, what's the ideal world that um, each of you are trying to make? You know, so we had all the resources to devote to it. Um, hit you be training, hit training, everyone be doing some kind of form of hit training or working towards that. And then the communities would be built to be very walkable. I don't know like what your vision of, just your vision of the ideal world would be. Yeah, I think I have an idea, but maybe what, you can what help you, me confirm. What do you think it is? <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, doing, going from absolutely nothing to something. <laughs> That's all I got. Because <laughs> 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 you, you didn't say it wasn't sit less, right? You said sitting and standing more sometimes is not the right answer. Yeah, it's, so uh, I'm not trying to be coy, okay? I'm trying, I'm trying to be careful. Uh, the um, uh, so what you're you're saying sort of what's the ideal is that what you're saying the, sort of the utopian right. okay, variety of what we're doing okay and so 
Uh, first of all, I would, I would always say, if you can, and you, and you have time and you have desire to, to, to do interval training, and you want to ride your bicycle, and you want to do all those things, that's great. Um, uh, I, I'm not real confident that that's, that's, and I have to be frank about it, which is a debate, I guess, is that that's a public health solution. How many people are going to do it? Um, uh, I'm a cyclist. I like to walk. I like to. I, like, I love to do push-ups and pull-ups. I love to do all that kind of stuff, right? Um, but I'm not sure that there's going to be a large percentage of the population doing that before I die. Um, and and so I don't know in these in these um, American cities that develop better bike lanes how many people actually end up using them. I think it's a lot of what well, what it is is a lot of people who are riding anyhow on bad roads, and then they get to the safer, better roads. Um, and I just don't know. I mean, that's just all I can speak from is just a, a non-expert that likes to see that stuff. Um, so what I'm going for is more like some of the earlier questions. People who are, who are saying, I've got the willpower, I've got the desire, give me something that's very potent physiologically, that's going to change my body a lot. So then what I look at is I say, okay, what's the biggest gap? If you have, for example, a financial portfolio and you say, well, I'm doing okay in this area, I'm doing okay in this area, but this area, I'm really doing poorly. I've got a really major problem, right? Then you need to fill that gap and, and you balance out that portfolio so you, you have a much stronger stance. That's the way I sort of view health and, and I think about it in terms of what's the big problem in America? What's the one that's staring us at the face? And it's the fact that we all are inactive seven days a week, you know, even if you exercise. And then I say that 5% of the population accounts for 50% of the healthcare spending, okay? That's a big problem. And, and, and so the, the poor health of those individuals is, is, of course, horrible for them, but it's horrible for all of us because it affects all of our healthcare, doesn't it? And, and so, it, it, it's it's a and it's an escalating problem, and so I would argue we want to go after solving something that can be more universal, and uh, so my utopian society would be that we would all spend at least another four hours a day doing low intensity physical activity, even if it's less than two mats. Resting is generally about one met, they say, you know, but it, in reality, it's more like 0.8 mets, okay? And so, so, so if you could have a 50 to 100% increase in metabolic rate throughout those sedentary hours that we have, that would be, to me, the utopian. That would be the holy grail. That would be the Nobel Prize. That would be the, the, what we've been looking for. That would help more people, even those who do exercise. That recommendation is not even close to being out there, but I say that's what we're striving to do in my own lab. That's what we've been working on diligently, and and when we get to that point, um, I hope that people will be able to recognize, wow, you know, that's that's let's evaluate that now. How can we, as practitioners, apply that with the patients we're working with? That's the that's where we're heading, and I wouldn't be saying that if I weren't quite optimistic. We're going to get there. The 2018 uh, guidelines. Well, yeah, yeah, just right. So, 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 so now there's acknowledgement that that uh, the in, there's not a three met intensity, right. so that's quite important um, threshold there. It, and then also that the activity doesn't have to be ten minute bouts of whatever; it can be intermittent throughout the day. And people have always kind of thought that anyhow, but it's um, and there's probably some other changes. But that what I'm saying, to be honest, is if there was a continuum. That's, 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 not, that's a nudge. I'm talking about way out to the other end. I mean, we're, we're talking, let's add another 25, 30 hours a week of healthy muscular contractile activity so people with PAD can, can be at an intensity that doesn't cause pain, but they can get that sheer stress and they can start to cure the PAD because exercise is right now really the only viable therapy. And, and so I don't want to raise blood pressure in somebody who has other problems I think about my elderly parents and stuff, and to ask them to do something intense. I can't get my mom to walk to pick out the, you know, her own clothes. And so, you know, it's we we're going to have to keep the intensity low in those people. I would argue. I got it. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, and 
I guess just on, and again, it's, we're all on the same page, but I, I, I think suggesting that people are going to do four more hours of activity um, is, is fanciful. I think that's just as unlikely as doing a few boats of more vigorous exercise through the day. And I, I think part of it is changing this mindset that exercise is you change into spandex and you go to the gym. You know, you, you, you get out here at Reagan Airport, you lift up your carry-on, and you walk up two flights of stairs. You just did a body weight style interval workout. Um, and But people don't think that way. And so our challenge on the interval side has been coming up with the evidence to show that that's actually beneficial because people don't believe that. Um, but I think there's ways to incorporate brief, more intense bouts of exercise through the day that would be extremely uh, beneficial, including don't make it so hard to find the stairs in a place like this. No. Don't, don't put an emergency exit on it. Um, all right, so, so I got to make my plug. Did anybody walk to or from National Airport? I walked over already today to, to uh, make, print out my boarding pass. It's just to prove to myself you still can. Mount Vernon Trail is right across the street here, right across the major highway. There's a beautiful underpass on the trail, the Mount Vernon Trail. You can access it. Somebody's looking to go for a run, you can do it. Or you could grab one of the Capitol bikes and ride from here 20 plus miles to Mount Vernon in one direction on an off-road trail the whole way, or to downtown to all the malls, you know, to the mall and all the monuments, going across the Key Bridge on a pedestrian and bike facility the whole way. Now, I don't think we do a good enough job of publicizing all that, and there should be signs, and there should be, you know, they should, we should make that a lot easier. But I may well walk over after this to get on my flight, and I'll get my HIT workout for the day. But I also walked over there earlier, so I got a lot of long duration today, too. So I'm doing both of their things. I just want to be clear. I'm already there. I'm on it. Both of you. Okay. I haven't walked to the airport, but that I can't walk six-minute mile pace either, yeah. so... <laughs> duration workout, okay? It's intensity doesn't always mean it has to be over the top. In fact, that's really important with the individual. I have an 80-year-old dad who's reversed four chronic illnesses I knew even before. And it all came with being diet and exercise. So what does he do? He sweeps. He goes for trash walks. We live out in the country and he'll go and he'll walk around and he'll make sure the trash is clean. They're simple things. People complain about not having enough time. How many people sit in front of the TV? How many people are on the internet? How many people are playing Facebook? The, you know, we as professionals need to deal with those arguments. And that's why we do individual training or group training. It's our job to be creative. Um, walking. You know, my mom's 77. She's now doing 5K walks with me. She never, never found them. She just, we have to start slow and gentle. We've got to build them up to it. She now walks with greater intensity. She couldn't have done that a few years ago, okay? But she does it because she has to keep up with me, okay? If I send her for a walk with my dad, that's not going to work for her. I've got to partner her up with the right person. So that's the trainer's responsibility. I don't think it's the responsibility of a three-person panel to do everything that we should do. You know, I think we're all creative. I think it's going to be different for each individual. You know, you've got to look at when a doctor tells you, hey, that heart rate can't go over 110. Okay, well, what's intensity for that man is not the same as what's intensity for another. But you know what? They can become more active. So, you know, you have a client who's sitting in a chair a lot. Have you ever thought about putting a cycle a cycle there in the middle of the living room or the break room and getting the old man out of the chair and saying, you know what? You can't go sit in that chair until you've given me this many minutes of cycling. And have him have a car ride. Have them keep it down. You know, sometimes older people don't really mind being told what to do. They kind of like being told to, because you know, in their generation, 70s and 80 year olds, they didn't have it. They didn't have the Framingham Heart Studies, and they didn't grow up with the Presidential Physical Fitness stuff. But we've come through that. And if we can't be creative with it, then maybe we need to be starting to, you know, let's interface with each other, let's network with each other. I'll say, hey, what ideas do you have? What have you done? What have you done? But I don't think it's up to a three-person panel to have all the solutions. I think we've done an excellent job in presenting. If we start getting a culture that will start becoming more active, 
they will push the politicians for more of those things. But I don't think it's going to start from just pushing and plugging for more money. I think that we have to set up the, the enthusiasm. We've got to take the ball and we've got to be willing to run with it. They've put it in our court. Thanks, guys. I think it's been outstanding. Thank you, Maria. I'd like to thank our panelists. This was actually wonderful. Uh, we really look forward to Dr. Gabala's talk in the morning. You get a lot more information, a lot more detail. 8.15, 8.30? So I hope to see you all there, and thank you very much. And there's some line dancing happening in about half an hour. Thank you.